Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, we explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. And I'm Lee Colvert. We watched a movie. We did. We watched a movie kind of a while ago. It was in the movies, we saw it, and now it is available for home viewing, etc. And we're going to talk about it on the show, now that you can get it again. Cool, what did we watch? Alien Covenant. Covenant? Alien Covenant, directed by Ridley Scott and released in 2017. Hey, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the movie, and also the last movie, Prometheus, probably. Although that's, that's questionable sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we don't talk about the movie at all. I think those are some of our best episodes, but we'll see what happens. Hey, Colbert, what is Alien Covenant about? Aliens. True. Multiple types of aliens, though. And androids. Yeah, that, that's it. And religion. So this is a uh, return to horror. It's just the sequel to uh, Prometheus, yep. and this focuses more on the horror aspect of the aliens themselves. Yeah, we're Prometheus, and we covered that on the show. Definitely check out the episode. DecipherSciFi.com slash 90 for episode 90. That was a long time ago. I know. Where we covered uh, Prometheus, the original, not the original, the last Aliens film, where it was very much an origin story of all that stuff to begin with. This one definitely looks a lot more like Alien, Aliens, you know, slasher movie in space type thing. People are on a voyage to settle another planet. Yeah, it's a, it's a colony ship out in space. It is, surprise, surprise, called the Covenant, the ship itself. Off to some unnamed planet. Yeah. Because I don't remember, and Chris doesn't either. <laughs> it might have been unnamed. Anyway, it's a colony ship out in space, and they find a planet on the way and decide to detour there. And it is a horrible decision. Even in even in the moment looking at it, I think it's continuing the theme that we saw in Prometheus. Or the the people that are running the show that are professionals in a role are all like really bad at making decisions. What? Okay, so this is a continuing trend of people with poor protocols. Poor adherence to protocol. Let's assume or there's even a good system. Poor adherence to protocols, or they just don't give a crap. So this ship, it is kind of large. It is a, what we called it a colonizing ship, a colony ship. Yeah, or at least a transport ship full of people. It has to be large enough to transport, well, it has to be large enough to transport people, but most of them are not up walking around. They're in like stasis pods. There are 2,000 people, colonists. And another 11, 1,200 embryos? Yeah, ish. And also the 15 crew that are woken up immediately when stuff goes wrong, including James Franco, who burns alive in his tank. Yeah, so he doesn't wake up for long. And it is the year 2104. I, I tried to take down the years because we, we should get a sense of like when this is happening in the alien universe. It might help us consider some things. So if we look at Prometheus, that was 2093. Alien Covenant, which is this, is 2104. The Alien movie, the first Alien, was 2122, and Aliens, Cameron Joint, was 2179, so 57 years after the first. So we're still pretty early on. In Alien, in the whole Alien story, sure. Especially because at the end of Prometheus, there doesn't even exist the xenomorph as we know it yet. Getting there. It didn't have the mouth and mouth. It didn't drool everywhere. It wasn't quite the Alien we knew yet. But before alien stuff happens, this ship is a colony ship again. Colony ship on the way to the planet that we can't remember. It is only a seven and a half year journey wherever they're going, though. So there is some form of faster than light travel or superluminal. Or at least they hinted at it by saying uh, jump, I think was the, the word. Yeah, and the distances involved are rather large. It is nice that they have stasis, however, because then it doesn't really matter to you as a traveler. And it is packed to the gills of people, although the crew is only 15. I saw a thing that I thought was very interesting. What would that be? Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking, I think it was about this movie, Prometheus. He was talking about some, one of these. And he was saying, I haven't actually verified the idea, but let's assume he's right about stuff, that there was genetic evidence pointing that about a dozen families, basically, are the seed for all the life, for uh, all the human life that developed in North and South America. Which is a remarkably small bottleneck. Yes, you would assume that you'd run into a crippling lack of genetic diversity. Is this just an issue later on with not wanting to be wiped out by diseases? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But they do have, what was it, 1,200, 1,400 embryos? And a crew of 
2,000 colonists. We don't know the makeup of the colonists, however. It's interesting what we see. We see the crew of the ship is 15 people, and most of them are married pairs. Yes. Or at least are, are pair, human pairs, whatever their, their legal status. I think that was very interesting. That is not something you see for a spaceship crew in a lot of movies. And also, I wouldn't even, I never would have presumed that was a thing to do. Like, I, I guess maybe it's the thing that we tend to see is like there's a military sort of structure to a mission because it's a mission and there's a military thing. It's like a Navy deal. The Navy analogy doesn't tend to get represented as romantic pairs as the crew. Well, this seems to be a one-way trip. You're going to this planet and making a new life, but you're still working for us. You're right. going to work and your partner, I guess, you'll both be trained in whatever is necessary function for that ship. You get to go and establish the industry that they need. And then you don't have to pay for the ticket. I assume they subsidize heavily. And it's also interesting that they were not all hetero. It reminded me of an episode of Liam's podcast, though, Voice from L5, which we haven't managed. We've managed to not mention in the past few episodes, so let's make up for it. He had an episode where he talked to ethicist Tony Milligan about how we might design our crews for different space ventures, colonizing, etc., is this how you primarily want female couples? That is, it seems like that's generally a good answer. Yeah. And we might have touched on this sort of thing before, but consider what you're doing. You're going into space and you're trying to colonize, maybe not even settle. You're trying to colonize a, a, a faraway planet. We should, unless there's something we don't know about this, we should really expect that like it's going to be really dangerous. It's going to be really, 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 really dangerous. And if a lot of people are going to die, you also want to make a lot more humans. So I'll link to this episode in the show notes for sure, because it was a really cool talk, like a lot of his episodes are. And yeah, depending on what you're doing, it seems like th there. I think there's a tendency to presume that uh, traditional pairings are the right idea, but it seems like that might not be, the, it, it shouldn't be that obvious because it isn't. And if your designs of your mission are something like you're going into a dangerous situation where a lot of people are going to die, if you're designing, optimizing for reproduction, you want lots and lots of wombs. Lots of them. And if you don't have science stuff to do that for you, you want lots and lots of females to bear the children. And then maybe, so we, don't, we see that the crew is paired off, but we don't know what the colonists look like. And maybe there's a bunch of women to go with all those embryos. Or they have artificial wombs. I mean, we're keeping embryos. There's got to be some kind of plan with that. Right. And if there are, like, if there is technology taking care of that for us, Judge Dredd style. Now, population bomb. You just send a ton of genetic material with wombs to a place, and then you just, <laughs> you start a bunch of people, you grow them up, and then they have kids, and then you keep growing your numbers. The numbers, it's a numbers game, this, being so dangerous. Which is actually the reason that you, you just send robots first. Actually, we don't know how much they've done ahead of time, but don't send humans into mysterious circumstances. Well, that's been an idea is you send robots out with the artificial wombs and genetic material. And then that first generation is raised by robots. We don't have a way to do that yet. It's interesting. And in fact, we had the example of the sheep being gestated in basically a sack on a table, which is pretty cool. So maybe we're going to be there pretty soon. Although uh, setting aside any ethical implications... That people are going to get all weird about it. Hi, parental unit one. Yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, but given that, then you get a lot of leeway. That'd be a really nice thing to have for a space settlement. Because then you don't have to design around wombs when no longer is the main qualifier for being in space that you have a womb, but other useful skill. But in this case, we do have androids. You'd imagine that they could just make the entire crew androids, but they're probably really expensive. It's probably literally cheaper to have people. Yeah, I would have spot. to assume. Even in this world where they're about the place enough, uh, uh, you'd have to assume it's still expensive enough because there'd be no reason not to do that then, to have the androids do it for you. But this is just, this is keeping with the theme of the people in these movies make very bad decisions, especially the scientists who make like very <laughs> it bad judgments. It would have been a great movie if they made the right decisions. Like, we don't really know about that place. We'll report back about it. They can send probes. We're going to go to the original location. End of movie. Just rolls the credits at that point. It could have been good. <laughs> before, before they get to the planet, though, they are, they, are, uh, they are affected by a neutrino burst, which is not usually a thing that affects much. 
No. <laughs> no, it typically, typically goes for three. Like, like it hold, is right now. Cool. Let me ask you a question. All right. Think of a thing that's not going to affect anything when it happens. Okay. What is it? Okay. Neutrinos, Chris? Yeah, neutrinos. Ding, ding, ding. You win. It's funny that they had this event was a, a burst of the thing that is least likely to affect any matter that they could think of. A neutrino from Wikipedia is a elementary particle that interacts only via the weak subatomic force and gravity. It's really tiny and has a really small mass. Hopefully we're wrong and it was, hey, we detected an unusually large amount of neutrinos. Something's coming your way. Okay. Well, the first thing I thought of is the thing that makes a lot of neutrinos tends to be like like suns and especially like suns exploding. And if you're detecting neutrinos because they came from a supernova, like you're probably already going to be blown up by that sun explosion. So no big deal. That must not have been it because they're not vaporized, right? So I wonder about how, when it said neutrino burst, did they mean like we detected we detected one neutrino and you should be alarmed? It's just the nature of the thing is we're talking about like a really non-interactive particle. They can interact through gravity or the weak force and they're so very small and so very weakly interactive that I might I think I'm getting all this right that it's the frequency with which they collide with anything else is very low. Really small. We have neutrino detectors. To put it in perspective, have you people might have seen these sort of things? We have neut- neutrino detectors. We bury them in the ground. Like like a mile or whatever. I think a half mile is the one in Japan, for instance. The idea being that there's other energetic particles that can mess with our trying to measure. So we put it underground where only the thing that doesn't interact with other stuff will reach, generally. And then you fill it with a large amount of water with a lot of sensors all around it. I think it detects the Sharonkov radiation from the interactions. So it's pretty much just looking for flashes in this large underground container. And when 65 billion of them are passing at a time through a square centimeter, that's a lot of neutrinos. And the frequency with which they actually get one, it's not frequent. I saw somewhere that, to put it in like the perspective for how, how unlikely interactions are, is if you had a light year long piece of lead and shot neutrinos through it, only 50% of them would have interacted in the course of that passing through that entire light year. That's crazy. So thinking of that, and thinking of they just detected neutrinos on their ship, there must have been a really crazy energetic event nearby or like unbelievable new particle detection technology. There was another tool for perspective on this that you showed me. Oh, yes. What if? What if what? What if? Just what if. That's all. That's it. The creator of XKCD, whose name is escaping me at the moment. Randall Monroe. Randall Monroe, who you might be familiar <laughs> with as the creator of XKCD. That guy's he, awesome. Uh, yeah, so he takes questions that people have, like, what would happen if you could throw a baseball at a significant fraction of the speed of light? Or the one we talked about previously in the show was in our Life episode, the movie with Jake Gyllenhaal and Ryan Reynolds, et cetera, where he answered a question about the speed of the space station, blah, blah, blah. But this one, this one, there's another, there, we have another tool for granting us a perspective on on how neutrinos roll. The best type of tool, where someone else does all the work. So the, the question was, how close would you have to be to a supernova to get a lethal dose of neutrino radiation? So it turns out supernovas are quite energetic. Supernovae? Well, the thing that puts it in perspective is, which would be brighter in terms of the energy delivered to your retina? The supernova from the distance of the Earth to the sun, or a hydrogen bomb that is touching your eyeball? The answer is the supernova by magnitude of nine. So now we're not even talking about neutrinos anymore. We're just talking about how awesome suns are and how giant. But that's the sort of event that creates the giant barrages of neutrinos that would then be very detectable. You'd have to have so many of them to have a significant number of them be detected. So point of the story is, suggest a very energetic event, maybe nearby, but also like we get waves of neutrinos sometimes when something else goes boom. It's just interesting that it carried with that burst other energetic particles that were of a nature that it actually interacted with the ship. The ship got busted up. So I'd like to assume that wasn't neutrinos, but rather some wave of charged particles. Actually, I remembered something. What would that be, Chris? I remembered something, and I looked at the details. I remembered that the idea that the neutrinos would generally be expected in a supernova to precede 
the larger wave of energetic particles. And that was the idea, and the looking up part, because I don't remember any of the names or numbers, was in the 60s, some dudes theorized that that would be the case, and it was the the thermal energy in the newly formed neutron core that would be causing this neutrino burst. And that would be before the super duper light show that would follow. And this was confirmed in 1987 when that's exactly what we measured from a supernova. The neutrino signal from the supernova arrived at earth hours before the first electromagnetic radiation as expected from what they were saying and confirmed. Science is fun, man. So that's the beginning of the core collapse before the bounce is when the emission starts. Here's the thing. Here's more Wikipedia for you, but think about this for a second. Because they interact so little with matter, much of the visible light comes from the shock wave, and even light from the explosion itself is scattered by dense turbulent gases and delayed. Thus, actually, you'd get the neutrino burst possibly before you really see the supernova. And so we actually have the supernova early warning system on Earth. That is our network of neutrino detectors that we use because here's the thing, if a sun's going to explode, it might be kind of hard to tell. And that's an event that's very interesting and you want to record. You want to collect that data. So we use our collection of neutrino detectors to try to get like a leg up on the whole event by looking for those bursts. That's really cool, though. And that is to say that on top of all this, like, I don't know how they fit one of those on the spaceship. I don't know how many they had on the spaceship. But were you aware that we have small neutrino detectors now? I... I wasn't. At least ones that aren't giant steel tanks of water buried deep in the earth. Yeah, that's an inconvenience, having to bury them and also have them be thousands of gallons of water. How small? You can walk around with it and not have to be, like, a strong man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can walk around with it. You just have to be able to pick up car. Yeah. Know, that's all. I mean, some people could do that. Yeah, it turns out that if you mix up some, like, sodium and cesium something or other, blah, 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 you get a neutrino detector and it's pretty tiny. Yeah, about the size of a red box, whatever size that means. <laughs> it could mean it, anything. It's so variable. But that's really cool. And I guess, in general, miniaturizing technology for a specific purpose does tend to be something that is then adapted for more general use eventually, under the best circumstances. So you could hope that this would just make all the research in the area easier. That's pretty cool. I got to put the picture in the show notes. It looks neat. Of the smaller neutrino detector. The baldy mad scientist and this his little... This was like, also the one that... It looks like a steampunk lamp. <laughs> yeah. It does. What? Uh, this one, this was also, I believe, the um, first observation of a glancing blow from a neutrino. So just uh, just the transfer of momentum without being catastrophic, a collision. Yeah, so I guess when we do the water thing, the larger tank, we're looking for something... The neutrino hits something and they like blow up. Yeah, it smashes and there's a large release of energy versus sure. this is a small amount of uh, transfer of momentum. When I say stuff like I just said, I'm always like self-conscious that someone, i.e. Adrian, is like smacking himself in the head, getting all like frustrated with our total misrepresentation. <laughs> it's like filling a balloon with air. <laughs> <laughs> and then throwing ping pong balls at it. <laughs> exactly. But it's a bowling ball balloon. Yes. Exactly. And I that's, love that's what happened. <laughs> and then you reverse the tachyon field. <laughs> Is that better? There you go. I don't have very good techno babble. Take that, physics. So now we have a path, I guess. We have some miniaturization of our neutrino detection technology. Maybe that's evolved over whatever couple hundred years, and they have it on a spaceship. Good for them. Neutrinos, dude. Unfortunate event. Whatever happened, some exploded. I don't know. It effed up the ship and killed a bunch of people, including Captain James Franco. So new captain, new captain is the religious guy. Ridley Scott, it's not, he like, he doesn't hide his, his hostility towards religion in his stuff. You notice it. It's not like a secret. I mean, man literally has a creator in this universe. Not this universe, but in the universe of the movie. Right. Yeah. He's like taking the piss out of the like Christian mythology. By having swole Jesus. He's even been explicit about his whole thing with, with. In particular, the Christian mythology. In the aftermath of Prometheus, he talked, and it was something that was in the original script that got kind of cut out, where he was more explicit that, remember the timing of when that ship, the ship containing the black goon Prometheus, the timing of when that ship was disabled, whatever, versus what was going on on Earth, and it was... So was it Easter? It, was, it wasn't, I don't know if it was exactly <laughs> Easter, but the thing that was suggested maybe that we, I think we talked about it a little in Prometheus and was more explicit in the original script was that 
Jesus was first an historical character and two was an engineer. Not like he built windmills, but he was the alien race, the giant white swole dudes. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I didn't like misphrase it from Carpenter, but rather he was <laughs> one of those big white swole guys, the one of the aliens. Yeah, maybe he put a disguise on. Like you think that would stand out? I mean, that's why I got crucified. <laughs> The idea being that the engineers made man, and they were rather like the Abrahamic God, just unhappy with the performance of man and wanted to like wipe it all out. You know, well, the the God character might choose the flood. In this case, he chose you know black goo that didn't quite make it to Earth. That Jesus character was an engineer sent down to be like, hey everybody, take it easy, chill out, and they crucified him, and then they were like, now it's time to kill Earth. Oh, uh, okay. But you're right about Swole Jesus then. Because if you remember, the main characteristic of the engineers is they are yoked as hell. Swole pasty Jesus. My shaker cup runneth over. Have you seen Korean Jesus? He looks a lot like them. Like the, the big marble statue. Yes, this was a Reddit thing sometime. So it's just a game of telephone with religion. And then you get everything. It's all messed up. Yeah, who knows what went wrong along the line. So, uh, yeah, religion... It's a pretty big deal. I don't know what to say, man. It does tie into man's greater search for meaning in life. That we're not just this random byproduct. Yeah, well, note that that was actually like one of the main takeaways from Prometheus and is also kind of the point of this movie and is even the very opening of the movie concentrates on that. Where he literally says, I refuse to believe yes. this specific <laughs> thing. Yes, I, I refuse to believe that I don't remember what he said exactly, but the idea that we are just the result of the random walk of evolution, of, I should say, natural selection, he being... um, Wayland? Wayland himself, who started the company that built the androids, David, and Southern Drawl David. In the first movie, the main character, the protagonist, the girl, always had a cross around her neck, she made a point of the whole thing. She was a believer. And then in this movie, again, it opens up with Guy Pearce's dude, with Wayland himself, Talking to his creation, he has made, he has made life in David, and I think that David fits any uh, measurement we would have for is this thing, an independent intelligence. We don't know if there's consciousness in there. It's pretty messed up if there is. We're getting we're getting halfway into why we're 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 getting like halfway into a Blade Runner discussion because it's like the same, it is the same universe. It's been established and it's a similar situation. The android that looks like a human, acts like a human, It by all measurements, internal the internal world of that thing, as far as we can tell, may as well be the same as mine or yours. I think we brought it up that there are multiple different types of intelligence. And it seems like he might be missing part of that emotional intelligence Well, that we need robots like him to have. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, that we think is important, for that sure. That it turns out is important, as we see from him and his, for- and his evolution. As you would say. Only for our interests. Yes. Right, yes. right, right. I mean, he's perfectly happy doing what he's doing. Well, just imagine w- human beings, right? We found out that we were created in a way that didn't make sense, but somehow it did, by the engineers. You can even imagine humanity coming to similar conclusions. Not quite the same thing, but a conclusion of, I have no respect for our creators. They were going to kill us, no less. We should try to kill them. I could see humanity coming to that conclusion the way David does for humans. In his case, he has no regard for humans or engineers and has murderous intent towards them because he has found himself a mission and they are all in the way. He definitely seems to become disillusioned. Wayland wanting to extend his life and the, the creators of man not being perfect, just like man not being perfect in himself, him seeking to create and I guess make perfection. I think that's it right there is he seems actually legit enthusiastic about their endeavor in Prometheus, right? He's like excited to find the creators and he's like actually, I think he is actually pumped about that. And by the end of the movie and then through the beginning of this one, including the prologue, I think we see that disillusionment happen where he's already been immediately disappointed by humanity. His creator and his enslaver is a disappointment. And then the one thing he had hoped for I don't know what he wanted out of it, but it seems that the engineers ultimately, I guess, being the same as the humans was very disappointing to him. Even that if was, even if they're not the same, but better, they were not good enough. Yeah, whatever they were, it didn't. It still that did not satisfy him either. So genocide. 
I guess. That's what you get. Yeah. Well, at the very least, this is, um, if those were engineers, it's probably only a single planet of many because they've been doing this for millions. Which, yeah, if thousands of years go by and they were supposed to bomb us and it hasn't happened, either something really bad went wrong, something really bad happened, or they just don't really care. Or, you know, like, you know, you have that, like, to-do the to, to do list app on your phone. Just keep sneezing it. That you use. Well, not even. Like <laughs> remind you, me tomorrow. You put it on there remind once. Remind me in 100 years. <laughs> you put it on there once and just, like, never looked at it again. And, yeah, that's basically what happened. <laughs> John was supposed to do it. He'll get to it eventually. So, basically, all the stuff we learn about What's-His-Face, it's all the stuff that happened before this ship arrived. He is on this planet doing alien experiments. His mission that he's taken upon himself is to create like a perfect he does he use these words right a perfect machine a perfect biological specimen something something or at least just to create he's doing a pretty good job there's a whole bunch of really gross alien stuff living there yes so this is the engineer's weapon which he describes as fiendishly clever as it'll liquefy you in some cases or make a really nasty parasite which is i guess the origins for the uh alien yeah so we see when we see him use the goo on the engineers they all like kind of die. But from that, he must have had a number of different evolutions of the, well, he of said the life he, form. He learned how to genetically modify the virus or the, the weapon. Mm-hmm. Because don't forget, we mentioned before, when we start this movie, Prometheus just happened. We still don't, Prometheus happened a while before this, but we still haven't seen the final version of the xenomorph that we're familiar with yet. He is designing that creature. But there, there was a, a very different sort of thing to begin with, I think. Because what we wind up with is not a parasite. Like, as I think a parasite would run its whole life cycle taking from a host. I think it's parasitoid, where a part of its life cycle, one stage of its life, that is the gestation, is taking advantage. Like a, like a parasitic wasp. Yeah, like a, like a whole bunch of different gross... Things that lay its egg in you and then they eat their way out. Terrible gross things or whatever variation on that where, yeah, gestating inside of another creature, taking advantage of their energy, whatever, and ultimately living the rest of its life cycle outside. That would be a parasitoid something, something. In fact, it and something we see in the movie, we even see examples of what resembles the stuff we talked about in The Girl with All the Gifts, the cordyceps fungus. And then towards the end of the movie, we finally get the xenomorph. The xenomorph as we expect to see it from the other from the original films. So the life cycle seems to be xenomorphs mate, fertilize egg into a little pod, and plant into a squishy, warm biological entity, burst, repeat. Notice there are no queens involved. Yet. It's just a further adaptation that he makes. So if we were covering one of the original Alien movies at this point, we would have been talking about it we probably would have a conversation about like natural selection or whatever and try to figure out the selective pressures that would create the alien creatures. And there's a whole man versus nature thing. And ultimately that is actually thrown entirely out the window because we find out in this movie that he, it's the hand of David. That would kind of stink uh, landing on a planet where they were like a biomes uh, predator and they came about without being engineered. And that actually, that might be why it actually maybe doesn't make sense. Because a creature that evolved in an environment with other creatures to consume and use all the other creatures indiscriminately so quickly seems like you would no longer have a population because you wouldn't be able to reproduce anymore. That would would be a difficult situation to explain. But now, given that David has designed the alien, that's the revelation of this film, basically— it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense because they didn't evolve as much as David just designed them that way. Their, and their origins were to eradicate all meat-based life on a planet. Oh, right. And the origin of the material that they started as, you're right, was indiscriminate murder sludge. We came from primordial ooze. They <laughs> came from <laughs> indiscriminate murder sludge. It giveth and taketh. But now that we're here, we have chest bursting aliens. We finally get the chest burster. That is the like, probably the the iconic image. Oh yeah, from aliens. Well, yeah. before it was a back burster, and it was came out of the giant. It was like an octopus type thing. Oh, and to note the parasitic wasp that the writers have mentioned specifically as an inspiration comes out of the, comes out of the butt. Pretty awful. So reverse we just, Vlad the Impaler. We didn't Vlad the 
Extruder? We didn't but <laughs> <laughs> So we didn't see that's, that in the movie. That's not awful sounding enough. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just confusing. It's like some <laughs> some oddly named pasta maker. What was I saying? Chest burster. Chest bursting. Iconic. Out the chest. Looks around, runs away. Yeah, chest bursting. And then it does the hello my baby, hello my darling. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure that was in the movie. There was an article where some people did some math on this. Oh, about the energy required? But yeah, think about this for a second. How big that is and how that could work. How quickly it would have to grow, the amount of energy it would require. Yeah, I'm going to put I'm gonna put the, the link in the show notes because they address a couple of other things. It would probably boil him alive. Oh, interesting. Right? I don't know. Well, first, it talks about like, will it break the glass with its head at the end when it's attacking the ship, blah, blah, blah. But the part that I, that I latched onto was the idea of uh, and crew design was something they talked about and did some math on that. But the thing that I latched onto was the the question about how a chest burster could work or a back burster for that matter. Because there's a similar situation. In both cases, you're inside a bone cage, a remarkably strong bone cage. And how could it get out? So they take inspiration from two different things to try to consider how this works. One, well, you can either bash your way out or cut your way out. So they look, one, at how surgery works, how we get into a chest and do cardiac surgery because we have numbers on that, right? We have a way to look at it. And the other case is uh, just how do we smash bones? Because we have examples of that with like boxing or other Also, well, it depends where in the body you're coming out. We're talking about the chest. Yes. But if you're a little further down, there's, a, there's an open yes. passage. Well, that's and the thing. if you're like a baby, you just push stuff around. Yeah. The real answer for it is it would just, it would come out of the soft spot that's right next to it. But since they don't, they're extra terrifying and gross because they come through the chest remarkably. So they just make assumptions like the aliens force production is like four times greater than a human would be, you know, whatever, just to make up a number. It also has the mouth mouth that is maybe that's useful capable of puncturing things. Or maybe it's a cutting device. Cause yeah, if we take the first set as what if we can cut through the chest and it's got four times the power of a human, just cause we need a number that works. It could cut through. Maybe it has a cutting mouth. Maybe there's a cutting wheel in the mouth mouth. <laughs> maybe it has a mouth mouth. Maybe it has a mouth mouth. What's, mouth that, saw. High <laughs> What's <laughs> that high pitch buzzing noise? <laughs> 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 that's actually not that bad and it makes decent sense the harder thing is smashing out of the chest for what it's worth our chests are a pretty good cage and the thing they look at is the punching force of a boxer so like a good solid punch here are the numbers they use a good solid punch is like 3300 newtons and like there's a quarter chance that you can crack a rib with that sort of force and 3,300 is even is even conservative. Like, an extra great puncher could do more than that by, by a good measure. So if we talk about the chest burst being four times more strong again, just to have a number, uh, its peaked impact force would be only, a, only a, a part of that. It's actually, it seems unlikely that it could burst out of the chest straight out of the bones. Which would just mean it would mean to do it over and over again, perhaps. Maybe it's a combo effort. Maybe there's a... a a saw saw in the mouth mouth. A saw saw in the mouth mouth, yeah. <laughs> and, and, a, and a big punching force. The actual answer would be don't come out of the chest. That's a lot of resources to spend when there's a fleshy bit right down there. Yeah, but just, eh. just go half a foot down? Yeah. But that seems how it works. It's, it's just nice to finally return to the chest burster and produce the xenomorph that we know and love. Nice, terrifying. One of those. And then some stuff happens in the movie, but we also get to a robot fight so robot fights are sweet. Robot fights are sweet. We're not talking... I mean, when you say robot fight, I picture like giant mechs punching each other type of thing. That's even sweeter. That would be pretty sweet. That's not what we get What about here. a robot piloted by a robot? And then like the big robot, he punches the other big robot, and then the little robots, they have to fight each other. Maybe the robot robot could cut the other robot robot with his mouth mouth and the saw saw. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Although, why, what's it a saw saw? I don't know. Because more's better? I understand a mouth mouth, but not the saw saw. <laughs> Hold on. You lost me a saw saw. Yes. No, but we don't get any of this. We get a normal uh, anthropomorphized robot fight. Also, is there like a lesson here about hubris and creation and playing God and whatnot? Probably. I don't know. Who are we to talk about that? That's the end of the movie. What did we learn? (laughs) Don't talk about hubris. (laughs) Uh, What did we learn? You need more Walters. If they had like three of them, they could have beat up David. They could have beat up the David. (laughs) That would have been been it. The other thing, um, neutrinos, man. In the process of collecting the words I needed to be able to talk about it, not completely incoherently, I, I learned some stuff. Did you learn their flavors? Was it like Cool Ranch? <laughs> 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 <Not your cheese. laughs> That's exactly what I learned. 
I'm, not, I'm just going to totally accept the thing you said. Okay. And uh, that's it. Now, recommend related stuff because we got some. Minute Physics has an episode on neutrino oscillation and neutrinos in general. Since we've been talking so much about neutrinos, both of those are probably worth watching. Yeah, I don't understand any of the things you said, but it's Minute Physics, which means it's only going to take a minute or two, and then I will know what you're talking about. For five minutes, and then, and then I'll, I'll forget. forget. Yes. <laughs> so there's that. And there's also a series of prologue videos for this movie, featuring more James Franco than was in the film by like orders of magnitude. It's like a supernova of him. Yes. Because compared orders, to the hydrogen bomb that was in the movie. Yes. <laughs> and it'll give some insight into the world of Alien Covenant and it's uh, world building. I like world building. World building is good. And now, considering all the stuff we've been talking about today, unlike David, you should support your creators. I love this place we're in, man. I was talking to Nick last night. He's talking about starting a project that would use Patreon to like get people together and fund it. I'm really excited to see my friends doing this sort of thing, man. More people should do more stuff. More people should make things, and they should make good things, and more people should help each other make more of these things. So we'll keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, if you think we're the sort of thing you'd like to support, DeciphereSciFi.com slash support the show will be the place to go. You'd be just like the people on this list of amazing people. Joe Ferraro, Dean and LSG Media, Nicholas Little Boy Low, Daniel the Antlander, Robert is Robert, Jeremy, Andy P of Batch 25 Comics, Brian the Sexy's Brother Peterson, Peter Van Lund, the Dutchman, Andrew Capitulo the Mighty, Jeff Schwarman, Chris Gennard, Mr. Ray Gun, Curly Phil, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Joe Ruppel, or Kobe FF, John, champion of Yoked Engineer Beavers, Daniel James Barkham, Uncertainty Principal of the podcast, Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes, DJ, Yoked Engineer Moffat, it's going to do for all of them, and my mom, and Grandma Judy, and Jolene, Magical Yoked Engineer Unicorn Joe Crazy. <laughs> 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 what does a yoked unicorn look like? An engineering unicorn at that. <laughs> it's a very, like, it's got, like, glasses and a pencil. It's got a beefy bicep on it. <laughs> a unicorn made of biceps. You can kick it with your energy legs. Ah, the internet. I love the internet. <laughs> One person might be like, oh. I know it, all of those things. Their name will be Joe. And does uh, ever com slash support the show to support the show. Like those awesome people. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm, I'm feeling really warm about all these people after their support for we just launched the meme seeks it was really fun and it lasted about six days before the frankyak people made their own we're at we they totally knocked out of the water i don't think this is going to work out it's a real shame however thanks to our supporters we had the time and resources to develop this engine even though the meme seeks isn't working out we can do another one and i think probably also open source the project that's why we cleaned it up a bit a lot I say, if there was enough supporters, we could make the six million dollar version of it. We could make it better. We if could we make had, it stronger. <laughs> if we had six million dollars, I'd be <laughs> all over that. Hint, hint. For six million dollars, I'd be able to quit my job and focus on meme and Jeff. Creation. You'd be able to <laughs> hire a team of people <laughs> to make a really awesome one. <laughs> that's no fun. But that's like the answer. Ugh. Pull of great ideas, Colbert. Yes, yes, I am. Do you have another one? You can also help support the show by telling others about us. Spread the word. DeciphereSciFi.com slash subscribe. That's the end of the show. I enjoy the Alien universe. This is fun. I'm looking forward to the next one. I'll keep eating these up as long as they keep putting them out. Look on our podcast works, you mighty, and despair. Is that why they're all bad decisions? <laughs> God! <Just> pent up energy. <laughs> Won't we ever space sleep and get a chance to <laughs> yet and make me make all these decisions?